already see my screen. Yep. Perfect. Because it's the first time I'm trying it with Canva. I really like Canva. Yeah. <laughs> so I thought I would see if I can do it. The only thing... Oh, no, I can still see you. Awesome. Okay. Great. Then we will start a recording and we're really happy to welcome our... Uh, speaker today, Francisco Sattler, um, from the Science Communication Cafe. Uh, looks really interesting and I am really uh, can't wait to hear more. Thank you so much for the introduction. Yeah, my name is Francisca. You can call me Francie. It's easier for most. <laughs> I'm a science communicator and a paleontologist based in Berlin. And over a year ago, the Museum von Naturkunde, which is the local natural history museum here in Berlin, it's actually one of the biggest and most famous ones in Germany. And it's a great place to work. And I've been um, a scientist there for, God, a very long time. I started out as an intern in 2009. And that was before I even became a scientist that was before I started studying but ever since then I really dove into science communication because if you work at that museum avoiding SciComm is impossible <laughs> they really like love it here and um, I got in contact quite early with it and that's when I realized this is my true passion I uh, finished my bachelor's in um, geology I went abroad for a while uh, to the United States because I, uh, like I said, I'm also a paleontologist and paleontology is really, really big there, uh, especially vertebrate paleontology. And then I did a master's in evolutionary biology. So that's a little bit about my background. And all this time I worked in SciComm. I um, connected here locally with other scientists who have a passion for it too. And I was actually offered a PhD at the museum, but I just realized I wanted to do SciComm way more than I want to do research. So um, even though I'm still involved in science and um, last week we published um, a paper about uh, T-Rex that I worked on uh, during my master's, I'm still mostly doing science communication in Berlin. Okay, so this is a lot of text. You don't have to read that. I'm going to do a little bit of storytelling. Um, I started working in Pint of Science. I think that's uh, maybe something that some of you already heard about in the past. Pint of Science brings well, science to the local pub. And I found Pint of Science in 2016 when I wanted to get into a lecture of a professor and it was completely booked. I couldn't join. I was devastated. But then in my local like, university Facebook group, I saw something about Pines of Science. I had no idea what that was. I just saw that that professor that I desperately wanted to visit the class of was speaking at that event. And a friend of mine, myself, we went there and I loved it so much that I decided I wanted to join the team. So I've been on the team in Berlin for the past four years. Uh, for a while, I was the Berlin city coordinator and that's actually how I started Science Communication Cafe because um, a few years ago, I think it must have been either, I don't actually remember, I think it was May 2019 possibly or even the year before, you know, it's 2000, 2020 and I feel like my brain is no mush so I don't even remember anymore. But someone from the museum came to the event to scout for people and different formats because they have newly opened rooms at the museum where they really do a lot of psychom. Um, it's called experimentierfeld, like experiment, experimentational like field where they have lots of different um, areas where people can do science. There's a kitchen for like a science kitchen. They have lots of different events there now. But when this person that came to Pine of Science first approached me, there was nothing there. It was just um construction side and i started talking to her and she said she really liked pint of science and she liked how i ran the events how i basically conduct everything and she asked me if i would be interested in doing something at the museum 
And obviously I said yes immediately without knowing what I would get myself into. <laughs> and she said, well, can you come up with something? So she had nothing in mind. She just said, we want you, but you have to come up with something. And I was panicked in the beginning because I was always doing everything in a team. And that's something I really enjoyed. And I've never started something out of the ground by myself. So that was the first challenge I faced. And then I thought, how do I get people to actually come to my events? And what kind of events should it even be? And <laughs> chances have it that my family celebrates coffee and cakes and everything like that on like a Saturday or a Sunday. If it's 3 p.m. and my parents haven't had coffee, we, all plans get canceled. By three, they have to have caffeine. And I'm a caffeine addict myself. I guess I got that from my family. And I sat together with my family and I told them about this opportunity. And my partner is from Canada, so he doesn't speak German very well. But he knew the word Kaffee Klatsch and he thought it was hilarious. Um, it's like coffee chit chat. Kaffee Klatsch is something you do with your family, with your friends. You sit together, you discuss what your neighbors are doing, what's annoying you, politics, work, everything you can think of. And you just do it over coffee. And I thought, oh my God, I love doing this. I love science. Let's combine the two. And I pitched it through the museum and they really liked it. Because even though I don't have a problem of getting an audience, because the museum is always full, I also wanted them to come specifically for this. And I wanted them to, well, find something that they might be interested in, like getting free coffee, <laughs> but also then uh, staying because they want to talk to a scientist because that is what it is. I um, get scientists either from the museum or from um, like institutions in Berlin um, to the museum on a Sunday and it's from two to four, perfect coffee and cake time. And then um, I try to get every different topic you can think of. We had everything from cancer research to invasive plants to bioinformatics, um, immunocompromised, um, like people that study like lupus, like, you know, stuff like that. We had lots of different topics already. And I try to get people to be, um, well, first interested in just hanging out and learning and, yeah, that was my, my way of getting their attention first. Come for the coffee and then stay for the science. <laughs> so yeah, um, this is a picture that was taken um, when we still had it at the museum. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about how it was in the beginning because we started in August of last year. It doesn't sound like a long time ago, but because we run it every month, I had so many events now that it feels like I've done this forever. Um, so my wish was always that it's a relaxing atmosphere. Scientists do not talk at the people. It's supposed to be a conversation, sitting together and talking, asking questions. And I had so many scientists participate who then said, oh my God, I never thought about this topic before. But then this like grandma <laughs> talked to me um, over coffee. And now I see this completely differently and I'm going to change the way I communicate this. And it's just really rewarding to see this and yeah it's on a sunday it's always the first sunday of the month easy to remember and uh, we provide coffee and snacks and stuff uh, free of cost it was provided by the museum um and there's me with a microphone intro <laughs> introducing one of the speakers um here we go there are a few pictures from the event so um our target group are adults Sometimes people come with families. That's completely a given when you work in a museum. Families, uh, young adults, we have seniors, really everything. Um, kids, they, we don't really do a lot for kids. So um, they usually lose interest quite quickly or they stick around with their families. And um, depending on if it's a nice day out or if the weather is bad or if it's a holiday, we have between... 20 and 75 attendees and that's usually people that are at the museum anyway so because it starts at two and goes for two hours we usually do two lectures so one at two and one at three 
with breaks in between so people that come to the museum a little bit later they can still have a chance to participate and not miss anything and uh, sometimes people join midway through and then I tell them hey you can come back a little bit later and they usually do so when they see there's something uh, for free and something that looks cool they uh, usually come back we had people stay for both runs before because they said oh yeah, I actually wanted to ask the ask more questions, so I'm going to stick around. So we have we have that too. <laughs> and in the beginning, we had uh, a little bit more like, um, you know, with a presentation, with slides, and people. I think I have pictures here. And people would sit down in the beginning, um, as you can see, like kind of on this on these platforms. <laughs> Excuse me. And because we got more and more people we started introducing microphones, so it got quite popular. As you can see, this was just, like I just took a few snapshots. So it became bigger and bigger, and now we had to do it a little bit more like a lecture, but there's always at least half an hour after where you can sit together and drink coffee and talk to the scientists. So um, if you can see here, that's one of uh, our scientists at the museum. She studies bugs and how climate change affects um, like urban insects and she sat there with um, some women talking about her research so it's really important to me that even if we have a lot of people that you can still sit together and actually discuss the talk that just happened or I mean people ask me questions all the time like oh when is the next talk what is the topic what are you doing here <laughs> like um, they, they sometimes ask me about my work it's just something that happens um, when you just chill together, it's kind of nice. And one of the things that I always love, what always happens, at least always one person that says, we had no idea there is research done here at the museum. We just thought there's like an exhibition here and our mind is blown, we had no idea. And I, that, that shocks me. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, it, this museum is big. What did you think was happening here? But at the same time, I'm just, I love it. Like it's, it's, I'm, I'm always surprised, but I'm always happy that people leave this with um, feeling like they learned something. And even if they don't remember everything, they're gonna remember this event and that it was something different. People really appreciate um, being able to ask questions and just sit together and having cozy atmosphere that's not threatening. Because sometimes people find lectures like boring or threatening and if you just sit together like that it's really nice a few more pictures here as you can see sometimes we actually bring um specimen so here we had <laughs> an event you can see it here on the on the floor actually um this professor was from potsdam which is close to berlin um and he talked about the rock of the year <laughs> uh, as a geologist myself who left geology I was like oh my god rocks we're going to talk about the rock of the year <laughs> I was just like barely aware that this is a thing but he talked about Andesit and it was one of the biggest events we've ever had we had like 80 people there I yeah <laughs> he was very popular um, so he put some rocks down there uh, for people to look at and then we had someone from the museum here and she studies amber and plants and animals in amber. So we had some microscope, people could look through it, uh, answer questions, uh, ask questions uh, directly to the scientist here. That's, that's her. <laughs> so um, yeah, she does it with the people she's not like oh yeah you can look through here she'll actually go and um talk them through what they see and it's really fun like i find um as, even as even as a scientist i find microscoping quite intimidating because always like oh my god i can't i don't know what i'm looking at and like we also did it together i'm like can you show me what this is and um so i'm always learning i'm always learning too which is important for me too and well then corona started <laughs> and the museum really restructured all of the events and now everything's ex exclusively um digital and uh in april i think we was the first time we didn't have a coffee clutch or a science commission cafe 
and that was just because everybody was still figuring out figuring out what was going to happen and um starting may we had it from my living room the museum was really eager to keep it going and um, i invited scientists one scientist that was already a speaker at the museum in i want to say september actually we became friends and she lives just across the park for me <laughs> and we went on walk walks frequently so she came to to me and we live streamed it via zoom and people could watch it on zoom and youtube we even have a new logo and and everything the museum is really um supporting the program and i think it's so lovely i don't i mean graphic designers are just amazing amazing like i could have never come up with something like that I, I wanted to include it because i think it's so beautiful and yeah we are now online uh actually tomorrow i'm gonna sign my new contract for another year of science connection cafe which i'm really excited about and we reach more and more people and it's still on the first sunday of every month we're not going to have one in december it would have been well, this Sunday, but um, the museum is just going on a complete like break. <laughs> I think everybody needs a break. So we're starting again in January. But what I learned from now doing it online, in the beginning, I was really dreading it because I thought really what we need is talking with the people. And if the people are not there, how are we going to do that? But I must say that I rethought so many things. It was really great to have this sit down with people actually on the couch and now we're doing it in the museum again without an audience um, but I'm sitting together with the scientists and it's like watching friends that's what I've been told that I obviously do my research I often know the scientists I invite As you can see here that's my friend Vera she's in Bonn and she's awesome <laughs> she's a neurobiologist she talked how uh, they grow um, organoids so little mini brains in the petri dish and yeah because we're already friends anyway um, the feedback was it's like really fun to ask questions because it looks like you join in two girlfriends just talking about science over coffee and I love that <laughs> I love that feedback um, we have a ton of fun <laughs> all the time. Um, I think this was from our birthday episode. So this was August. One year, I mean, I didn't include the pictures of us in the party hats, uh, but there were party hats involved. <laughs> uh, this, so this is uh, Lisa and this is my friend Anna. She was the second ever pint of um, um, science communication cafe speaker and she was also my first digital speaker because i wanted to have someone that i feel comfortable with that i would invite to my home um that i know anyway she was like my my guinea pig and it worked out perfectly um and what i really like about it it's it is recorded just like this is recorded right now and then the museum will um edit it and put it on their youtube channel so you can always watch it again later i think now we have only four of them online and there are a few more in the making so um i believe the next ones are gonna be uh published in the next few weeks um yeah and actually sometimes like i already watch them back because i just enjoy it <laughs> and yeah people can then uh watch it later which i think is pretty cool here you can see um me and one of like my, my friend um marta she studies lakes in berlin and this is at the museum so what we do now we don't do it from my home anymore we do it from the museum and they have these rooms upstairs where you usually the people well work <laughs> but it's a huge open plan um office huge uh almost like a warehouse but they have as you can see they have like comfy chairs and they have a uh, carpet and stuff and this is how we sit together and um talk so it's nice that it's not the museum again because it's still the museum run 
event. Um, yeah. And it depends now on how many people join. The thing now is the, the target group didn't change. It's still adults. But now we also get viewers that's supposed to say outside, <laughs> outside of Berlin. Uh, at one point, we even had a few Americans join that wanted to see Vera, for example. Most of our uh, PR is done directly by me. Uh, I run different social media accounts to promote the events. The official museum um, website always promotes it too, but not everybody's um, checking the event calendars. Let's be let's be real. So um, I do a lot of um, the PR online, and we usually get between thirty and seventy attendees. It's sometimes difficult for me to track because we will always do it via Zoom, but in the background, um, it's also live streamed directly from Zoom to YouTube. And because we speak at a huge flat screen TV, um, I always get the numbers after, after the event. So actually what I've learned is that we have most people join via YouTube. So most viewers come uh, through there, which I believe is because it's more like casual viewing. You can see it's on, you just click on it. You don't have to have a laptop. You can just either have it on the background or you know, if you don't want to install software, my parents, um, <laughs> my parents are not academics and they don't use Zoom. When I told them, oh, it's on Zoom, they're like, what is that? <laughs> I don't understand. Is that like, what is that? And I said, oh, it's like Skype, but it's not Skype. You know, um, they will only ever put, put it uh, on, on YouTube because they have a smart TV. They can click on YouTube, done. They don't have to install anything. And I believe that most people do it like that because it's just easier. So we do have most people join um, on YouTube. And we actually had a quite uh, a lot of success with the format um, last, was it last month? Last month uh, was the Falling Walls uh, like events like Berlin Science Week. Uh, I was active with Soapbox Science Berlin where I also am uh, a science communicator and actually also spoke at the event. So it was a double whammy that month because I also was nominated for, um, yeah, like the science breakthrough um like a science engagement breakthrough of the year um yeah that was really rewarding and i was the only format at the museum that made it to the finals so i think the museum was also quite happy about that <laughs> um and that was really fun because lots of people then started finding out about cafe Klatsch mit wissenschaft and uh, the engagement online came more and more so um people from abroad also you know follow falling walls so that was a really great well, pr for us and if you're interested you can see my little video on their youtube channel we had to do a five minute video of introducing the format answering questions and and all that but that was a really great um experience for me because i found so many other science communicators that do really awesome stuff and i realized that people are also interested in what i do and i um recently talked a lot about people from canada actually because i think about um moving to canada because my uh, partner is from canada and i connected with lots of people who thought <laughs> can combining science with coffee is the most genius thing and there are science cafes already out there um, so it's not a completely 100 percent novel idea but every time people hear it they just smile or they think like this is perfect because what do you even do in academia without coffee my friend anna would now <laughs> be mad at me because she is a tea drinker and i don't discriminate i also um invite people that drink tea and i drink tea with them but yeah, it's just something that really fits together quite well, I believe. Yeah, and I have a few social media um, outlets and you can find me online. I think maybe that's also why you're here now. Because I post about it on social media. But yeah, that was a, um, a short introduction about what I do and I love what I do and I love that the format is growing 
and getting more and more people. Um, and yeah, I hope to do it for a long, long time. And the museum just extended the contract. So I think at least for a while, we're going to keep doing that. And if you have Germany-based scientists that, or if you are based here too, or if you're even based in Berlin, please contact me because I always look for cool speakers. <laughs> and I would love to answer questions if you have them. I have no idea if I'm in time. Oh yeah, half an hour, right? So perfect. Oh my God, it's perfect. I've never done this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm amazed by this now. <laughs> So we start uh, the question and answer part of our event. Uh, so I think, uh, can I start please <laughs> with the yeah. questions? Um, how uh, did you bring to the, do to the Zoom this type of the, this atmosphere uh, with uh, like coffee and this comfortable atmosphere? Because Zoom, it's like, uh, it's just screen, you know, and everyone sits at their own places. How do you do it? So um, it's actually, I thought it would be the worst thing and it would be so difficult. And then it became really natural because I love entertaining and I love making jokes and laughing. And there's always so much laughter uh, and I often, or actually almost always invite early stage academics. We had one professor so far, but I love having PhD students who are super driven and super passionate about their topic. And I always have a set of questions I want to ask them too. I want the audience to get to know them. And before the talk starts, I will always ask them questions like, how did you get into science? Did is someone in your family a, a scientist? Is this completely new to you? What did you do before you did a PhD? Like I want them to get to know them a little bit because if they have the feeling they, oh, they went to that university, I heard of that. Or, or they also went on a study abroad. I did that. Like I want, um, I want them to feel like they leave this meeting not having a new friend, but gotten to know someone it's not just so much about their research but I think it's also about the person and because I'm also always so interested in these speakers and I always invite people that I find really interesting I think that also resonates with the viewers because I'm just always like oh my god I had no idea or like uh, my friend Marta who you saw in a picture she brought pictures of algae and of aquatic plants and to me, they look the same. <laughs> like, I had, like she, she was like, okay, Francie, tell me which one is algae and which one is an aquatic plant. And I completely bombed it. I was <laughs> wrong every time. She bought like three pictures and I was like, oh my God, I hope my biology like, teacher is not looking because I have to, you know, leave the country. And we just have a lot of laughs and it's um, really, yeah, it's just, a, it's, it's just watching friends and um we drink coffee doing a talk sometimes i'll just then drink or eat like a slice of cake and be like excuse me you know <laughs> like just do it as i would with a friend at home and there are actually a lot more questions online than i thought there would be i always thought we would just speak at them and then it would be really awkward but we get so many questions probably more than when we did it in person um, and also when people have their screens on, they're also often drinking coffee themselves or like any beverage that they might prefer. So it's sometimes really cool to drink coffee and then look up at the, at the people and then they're also drinking coffee with you. And it just came natural, I want to say. I love talking, talking in public and I don't care if it's in front of 80 people at the museum or 80 people online. I just really... Uh, excited <laughs> i'm just excited every time and i think that helps because we're doing it very casual and if something doesn't work we're like oh well let's start again <laughs> you know it's not that that is never a problem and one time oh god that that was one of my favorite moments ever you saw lisa the one with like her coffee cup on her head and she works with um <laughs> stool samples yeah, so um, 
she she looks at them in the lab and um she is working on uh like computer codes and stuff so she talked about code but also in german code is stool and she was like oh yeah i'm working on that code and then i'm working on that code and it took me a moment to like that for that to click and i was like oh my <laughs> god and then i couldn't stop laughing i was like a like a teenager it was so silly but i just sat there the entire time like this and she apologized the, like i'm so sorry i'm like it's fine it's fine and my mom watched it and she was like you guys are so silly <laughs> like she texted me after and i thought well people are going to remember this people are going to you know remember this happened and next time they read about code they're going to remember this event and <laughs> it was it was fun so i tried to make it as as fun as possible yeah that was a long answer okay. sorry interesting uh, and the second question is how uh, how do you choose the people who you want to invite where do you find them how do you contact them this um, so um i try to do it 50 50 of people at the museum and also from people outside so sometimes people get uh, recommended to me i had three speakers from um, the Charité, which is the local university hospital here. And Anna actually recommended two more people, inclu including Lisa. Um, and then we had, a, we had another speaker, Alex, in early November. November? Yeah. And um, so sometimes people get recommended to me and then I'll approach them. Oftentimes they will have already heard about this format because they watched their friends, for example, and said, oh my God, I want to do that. Can I do that? And then they'll message me. Then uh, one time I got someone recommended by the museum. The museum always lets me do whatever I want, which is great. But one time they said, hey, it's the bioeconomics year right now. Can we, can we like pitch someone to you who would be perfect for this format? I said, okay, have them, have them come. Um, but I also like stalk <laughs> my scientists on the museum website and then look at their social media presence. And then I see what, if, if they do SciComm, if they're interested in that, because of course they're also scientists who maybe have families and they don't want to come to the museum at the weekend, you know? And if you work at the museum, do you also want to come to the museum at the weekend? I don't know, like, would I go to my university <laughs> during the weekend too? maybe um so when i ask people um that maybe i find online or that come recommended to me or i'm pretty well connected because i do kind of science and soapbox science so i know a lot of cool people sometimes i steal them from other formats that that i've done or i ask them um if they would be interested usually i pitch it to them in an email or on social media depending on how active they are on social media. If I see that they're always on, like me, <laughs> I'll maybe try it there. And yeah, I like to have younger um, scientists. I must say I'm often um, gravitating towards getting women. And I mean, I also have, I have men. <laughs> but I think most of my speakers were women because I also love promoting women in science. It's one of the main things I love to do. So if I get to do that with my format as well, perfect. And one of the things I noticed a lot when we still did it at the museum in person was that when I had younger researchers, they would be a big hit even when, like, with the seniors. They'd be like, you young people do such great things. <laughs> they would just love it. Younger um, visitors would think it's cool because, oh, they're only a little bit older than me or oh they're a little bit younger than me like it's um it's more approachable as well and it gives them a chance to practice so and they're often like super into it <laughs> and they're more more likely to say yes than maybe the more senior um researcher who's done this for many decades and is a bit more tired maybe <laughs> 